So I'm Amy Gillentine. I'm the um, publisher and executive editor of the newspaper group here. Uh, Glenn, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Glenn Wallace. I am the editor for the Southeast Express newspaper. And I'm Mary Jo. I'm Mary Jo Mead. I'm one of the managing editors with the Colorado Springs Independent and uh, the Business Journal. Good to meet you. Love your nice. hair. <laughs> Thank you. Nice <laughs> to meet you all. As you know, I'm a candidate, Democratic candidate for a county clerk and recorder, Lisa Wilkes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, how you came to Colorado and family and- Ooh, how I came to Colorado. Are you a native? Uh, no, actually, I was born in England. Um, and I don't have the accent because I, when we moved, I was three and we um, moved to the South and it kind of got uh, beat out of me because I thought I talked funny. Um, so <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so yeah, I was born in England, uh, but my parents are American. Uh, they were just over there. And uh, let's see, I lived in Texas most of my life. Well, no, not anymore. I can't say that. I've been here in Colorado most of my life. Um, right 96 or 97 is when I moved, uh, to Colorado, um, first Fort, Col Fort Collins and then down here. Um, and so uh, let's see background about me. Um, I have a three-year-old, almost four-year-old as well. Um, I'm married. Um, I'm a mathematician, um, uh, also known as a computer nerd or a nerd. Um, I'm very data oriented. I'm organized. I'm consistent. Um, and, um, uh, I have a 15 year background in it as well. So, so why are you running for this office? Uh, so I, I don't know if you guys remember, but I actually ran in 2018 as well. Um, but then in 2021, um, I was a commissioner on the, um, Colorado independent redistricting commission, uh, the congressional one specifically, where we redistrict the state of Colorado into now eight congressional districts um, and uh, followed amendment Y and Z. Um, and it, it is the same process actually for our county clerks. Uh, they're gonna have to do the same thing now um, where they don't have to specifically do um, an independent commission, but they do need to um, have bipartisan effort on it and speak to people extensively as well. And it's the same process that I followed as um, one of the first people on the commission. So I have a very unique experience. I mean, that's the first thing that the clerk and recorder is gonna have to do is redistrict um, to balance our very, very large county. Okay. So so you talked a little bit and you kind of answered my, my next question was, what experience do you have that's relevant to the role? And so you talked about the redistricting part, but um, the elections and, and all the other roles that a clerk and recorder does, um, what experience do you have um, that's relevant to those, to those other responsibilities? Right, because it's a huge job. It, there is so much stuff on it. Uh, it's so with uh, when I worked with HP um, and in IT, I, I did project management, um, I did data analysis, I did big data, right? So, which is taking care of large corporations data, um, um, large information that you have to store for a long period of time. There's processes and procedures. Uh, there are rules that you have to follow to keep uh, data clean and um, things like that. It, it's, it's all the same kind of stuff if you think about it because we have this elections department, obviously, which is very important and you need very nice, clean data. You need to know that all the votes are taken care of and that they are, there's no question to what, how people voted or that the process is correct. So I'm incredibly detail oriented um, because of that. And then uh, as well in my career as an IT profession, um, quite often I was brought in to fix contracts that had issues and to make them more efficient, to make, um, to, to background everything, to put information together so that the next person also could do the same job very efficiently as well. Uh, and so it, it, while some people don't think that um, IT has a big background in the same um, field, it really is the same information, especially uh, mathematics and data 
And uh, of course, because I enjoy tech and I I value tech, I I like to find efficient ways to use tech while still maintaining a personal contact because you can't get rid of in-person contact. Everybody needs that as well. So. To interrupt, uh, we had, um, Helen, can you introduce yourself? Um, Since you- I can, hi. Um, Yes, sorry about that. I was having trouble connecting through my hotspot. Um, hi, I'm Helen Lewis. I'm managing editor with Mary Jo at the Indie and the Business Journal. It's good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So what would you change or innovate if you um, were elected to this position? So um, I, I would like to move some more things that we do online um, while, again, maintaining that uh, presence, in-person presence. I think that COVID specifically showed us that people need to be able to do a lot of things from home. Um, And so we can find safer and secure ways for people to do that. And I think that we could even, especially if we have some sort of lockdown situation again, we could still um, not only protect our clients, you know, El Paso County, but also protect our staff by allowing them through secure VPN networks uh, to do a lot of their work. Some things will still have to be done in person. I mean, you, you have hard copy ballots. You have to touch those ballots. You have to be in person for those. But there are a lot of things that we can do uh, to move things online. So I think that that is probably uh, one of the things. And one of the other things that I would like to do uh, is increase the ballot boxes and uh, accessibility for people, uh, especially in metropolitan areas. I think that people should be able to easily walk to a ballot box. Um, There's a lot of people who can't take the time off Um, If nothing else, we could put some ballot boxes on uh, some of the bus uh, lines so that people could easily have access to them that are working families. Um, And then other than that, um, I also want to reduce some of the mandatory fees that we have here for the DMV. Um, There's a lot of people who won't get a license because they're behind uh, and then they drive unsafe and then they have other issues and they could even get stuck in, in a loophole of it's too expensive now for me to go and get it. Uh, and then they're just going to be more and more uh, problematic. And then we have problems where we have to involve the sheriff or the other things like that. Uh, so anything that's not mandated from a higher office, I would really like to reduce, if not remove. Uh, it's just like the libraries found out that when they got rid of the charges for late fees, that people returned more books. And it has a tendency to be the same way where um, a lot of late fees really just limit access. So another thing I wanna do is I wanna live stream our audits. Um, Anything like that, that we have process wise that we can put it on, they do it now in Denver where they live stream audits. Um, So that's that's another thing that people have issues with with they're worried about security and, and the fairness because a lot of things happen behind closed doors but we can increase our live streaming for transparency. So I guess that's quite a bit. And I think you asked for one. Uh, no, that's that's great. Um, so how would you um, and restore trust across El Paso County and, and government and particularly in, in elections? Right, uh, there is a, a lot of distrust specifically around the Dominion machines right now. Um, and they've really been tested quite a bit. But another thing that I would like to do is see if there are uh, there's cybersecurity or kind of a white hat hacker. Again, I'm a computer nerd. Uh, approach. There are people that you can um, go to that specifically their mentality is to see what they can destroy and get into. And so I'd like to have the systems tested again, maybe with a little bit more of of that mentality for cybersecurity. Um, again, that live streaming, I think, will help. I also want to increase the regular reviews of the voter registration because there's a lot of discussion about the inflation of the voter rolls being large. And so I think if we do some more audits and reviews of those rolls, that'll help clear things up as well. Um, and then um, I think the live streaming will help. I, and I think that also increasing tours as well as encouraging people to become election judges. So you talked a little bit about your computer knowledge. Um, would you um, work with cybersecurity officials and things like that for 
to make sure um, elections are, um, are safe and secure, as well as people's information through the DMV and other places like that were, were safe. Yeah, um, because we do need security everywhere. And uh, when I think uh, one of the benefits for somebody like me is I know when somebody is skirting a topic because I do understand the technology better than most people do. Uh, when they're saying certain terms, I'm like, oh, that, that means no. You're trying to say no without saying no. And uh, because of my background with uh, computers, it's not like I'm just a manager who does something. I was in the weeds, you know, so I understand and can self-teach anything that's software that I don't understand fairly quickly. Um, sometimes there's a joke. I'm an expert, uh, an expert about what, give me a few seconds and I'll tell you whatever the next thing I'm going to be an expert about. Um, so, uh, I think that definitely we need to work with the data we have. There's a huge amount of data that we already have in El Paso County, uh, for the driver's information, for the, uh, at assets, all the things that we have to do as clerk and recorder, and we can make it very clean and organized. I think it's already pretty good, but I think we can increase it. And I think cybersecurity people, yeah, I would probably speak to them as well because they're experts as well. Okay. Um, can you talk about leadership roles you've had in the past? Um, so being a project manager is a leadership role of sorts, even though you may not be in charge of the whole contract, you come in and you take care of, this is this huge task that we have to do. Um, and so everybody's going to meet with me weekly or bi-weekly or whatever schedule. And I'm going to make sure that everyone's doing the things that they do. And so like the skills of being a project manager is the skills of being a leader. You need to be able to listen to people where they're, they're stuck. Um, what is their, their stops um, and be able to, to incorporate and fix those things as much as a person can. And so that was the job for such an extended period of time. So um, I've also was, I would consider myself a leader. Um, I did project managing as well in the commission um, as well, because they had a bunch of maps that they had to review. And the person who was in charge of our um, committee didn't have that project management skills. So I was like, is it okay if I project management this and put on that leader hat for a little bit? And she was thankful. In fact, they all were thankful um, about how well I organized what we had to get done. We had uh, hundreds of maps to look at and review, and we got it all done within a short period of time. Um, and so I think that that, again, the project management and leadership skill set. Um, what is your uh, leadership philosophy? How, how do you, how do you lead? Have you ever seen those memes that they have? I'm sorry, again, I'm being a nerd. They have where somebody is sitting on a block and they're whipping at people and then there's somebody who's up in the front and they're pulling with everybody. And like, those are the two different styles that most people talk about. I would say that I'm mostly a leader by doing. Um, I don't need to tell, I mean, there's still the, the need to tell people what to do, but I have found that um, if I know what I'm talking about and um, I know how to approach people, then they listen to me because I make sense not because I told them to do something. Um, and so I find that you have a respect with people when you listen, as well as innovate and clear up issues. Um, how would you work? Um, you are a Democrat and most of the other elected leaders in El Paso County are Republicans. How would you work across the aisle um, and collaborate? Uh, well, I think when it comes down to it, we're all people, all right? And, and I have talked to both of the other candidates and more than anything, we all want security around our elections. So we all have these commonalities uh, that we want to express. Now we have very different sets of opinions, um, but like I just, uh, this Wednesday, I went to the Church of All Nations. Um, I was gonna say summit, but that's not the right term. Uh, where they did for the... Um, the forum, thank you, sorry. The forum for um, the Church of All Nations for the county clerk and recorder position. And uh, I was the only Democrat there. They also did a forum as well for um, the sheriffs afterwards. Again, I was the only Democrat there. And um, what ended up happening is after we had the discussion, lots of people actually came up to me and thanked me 
for showing up as a Democrat. Uh, they, they jokingly said, you know, you're willing to come into the lion's den and face us. And, you know, I can't say that I wasn't nervous. Of course I'm nervous um, because I'm actually an introvert and not a good public speaker. So um, I, I, I really had a lot of people though who came up to me and thanked me for listening to them. They also thanked me for being a, a female candidate because I was the only female candidate. They also thanked me as well for um, giving them ideas that they had not heard yet. Um, and so uh, I, I, and I stated this to the, the lady who said that to me is that I had some new ideas that I also got because I was willing to come and listen to people who had a very different point of view. Um, and what, what it came down to a lot of times is while there was some confusion about certain things, like they were worried about the voter rolls being inflated. Okay, that makes sense to be worried about that. So it, it's not like one of the things that came up was to get rid of Eric and Eric, it's not going to help the voter rolls being inflated. It, we can we can clean that up on its own. Eric is actually a tool used across the county, uh, the not the counties, excuse me, across the state, so that if somebody votes here, they can't vote in another state. So that is actually something that keeps the elections clean. And so when you explain it that way, then they're like, oh, so there's not it's not a horrible bad thing all the way. No, there's problems with it. There's problems with everything. But when you start talking to people and listening to them and hearing what their concerns are, it's not an issue because you're you're listening. You have to represent everyone. I mean, the, the largest group of people actually now are unaffiliated here in El Paso County. We are the largest county in Colorado and we are mostly unaffiliated. Then comes the Republicans, then come the, the Democrats. So you need to listen to everybody. And why are there so many unaffiliated people? Because people have so many different viewpoints that they don't fit into one slot or another. So if you can't listen to people, then you're going to have issues. If you're just going to tow a party line, you're not going to listen to people. I mean, again, more unaffiliated than anyone else. They don't follow a party line. They're somewhere in the middle and most people are. So I, I can't say that I don't get nervous, but uh, it's more important to listen to others and hear people with a differing point of view so that you can change and improve yourself as a whole than to stick into a box and just say, this is what I do and all of what I do. Because the only way even technology advances is by trying something new and listening to someone else. So end rant. Thank you for that. Um, do, do any of you guys have questions? Uh, Glenn? Uh, what's your take on the potential for hand counting ballots? So um, Peter Lupio actually at this uh, forum that I was speaking about talked about that there's four other counties that do it and, and it is possible for a county to do it. Those counties are small. Again, as I pointed out, El Paso County is the largest, larger than Denver County, uh, county here in Colorado with over 400,000 voters that are registered voters right now. And it would be ridiculous the amount of time that it would take. Um, the concept right now is to do it at precinct level, the amount of, okay, we have over 300 precincts. So now you're gonna need to have like, you would need at least a group of three at each precinct that does it from each party person. So you would now need to employ how many 900 people just to be able to count on that day. And that's not enough people for redundancy. You need even more than that. So how much is it going to cost the, the taxpayers to pay for this slower and less precise method? And, and I know that people are worried about security, but when, when people do audits, when the clerk's office does audits now of elections, the people who make are the ones who make mistake when they're validating information and there's a discrepancy it's like 95 percent of the time it's going to be actually the people that made the mistake counting not the computers that made the mistake counting and so i think i understand that the concept is confusing and frustrating to people um, that the dominion machines seem to have an issue but it they are air gapped they're not something that you can get access to um, they are not on a network that is accessible from the outside whatsoever. And so I, I think in, in, in the process of trying to be more secure, we are going the wrong direction if we want to try hand, uh, hand count, counting in such a large county. Helen or Mary Jo? Um, I have 
one question that sort of follows on from that. Um, so Colorado has really consistently ranked as the top or one of the top states for free and fair and secure elections. Um, you've talked about the importance of listening to people. How, what about the other side of the communication? How are you going to communicate to people in this atmosphere of a lot of people having um, fears um, founded or not founded about election security? How are you going to get that message across um, as part of your role? Well, uh, thank you. I think that um, while you said Colorado is one of the top, even El Paso County is one of the top within the nation as well. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a lot that we do that is secure and above above the lines. But I think uh, having looked at our website and used it several times, it is not exactly user friendly. Um, there is also a ton of outreach that we could be doing as well. You know, regular meetings with the public to discuss things. Um, I went to um, a training yesterday uh, for uh, the clerk and recorder elections department. And there's so much information there that isn't out anywhere that talks about the security that they do. And even if they just videoed that one training that they did and posted it somewhere, there's nothing like specifically secret squirrel that they have to like, that they say to us in that they could give more information to the public. And I think they we need a new PR approach, you know, regular meetings with the public because, and, and even like a comment section on, on the website, people need to be able to feel like they're heard as well as hearing you. So we need that interaction with the public to maintain the trust. I mean, we can say we're number one, we're great at things, but if people don't believe it and hear it from you, or even hear you talking to them and hear you listening to them, they're not going to do it. So I would definitely increase outreach, you know, which, you know, I probably would personally hate because I don't like talking all that much, but I, I get there. <laughs> so, so, um, there are parts of the city where voters are, are voter registration is low, voter turnout is low, and there are specific election cycles where, where voter turnout is, um, abysmally low. Right. How would you, um, if elected, work to work to change that so i think that uh, and i would put this approach as something that like everyone kind of needs to do in politics is really it's not so much about just at elections talking to people it really is getting out into the community all the time and being able to speak to them and so i, I would love to have a team that does that all the time that's not specific to any of the, I mean, we need PR for all of it. Who loves um, the DMV? Nobody loves the, B, the DMV. So we need people to go out and speak to everybody more than just about elections. And so I think a lot of times that those locations that have a lower um, registration also tend to be working families. And so maybe they need to see people who are working families going out to them instead of people who are in business suits that don't really understand or connect with them. Uh, that need to be, they need to be heard all the time, not just when you want their vote. Uh, a lot of people don't want to vote because they think that their vote doesn't matter. And so proving that, that the majority of people that aren't voting are feeling that way um, and how many of those people can actually vote and what it really can change um, is another thing that we can do. Um, I think that uh, young people also have a tendency to not vote as well. And so there needs to be more. I know that we have a couple of groups on campuses that have uh, Republicans and Dems on like UCCS and things like that. But even more so than that, there's outreach that we can do as an impartial source. Another thing I also want to do is actually, there's a whole bunch of candidates for everything. And there's a whole bunch of uh, items that we vote on each time. And, and a lot of times the wording is really confusing on those things. And they're made that way so that people will vote one way and they're actually voting the other. And so what I would like to do is, is um, incre uh, sorry, include a website uh, that has from us the links to everything we found they can submit to us as well. Not only the conservative viewpoint, not only the liberal 
viewpoint, not only libertarian, not Democrat, everything that anyone wants us to submit on every one of those things. So here's this page of a whole bunch of things that you can go and read about and speak and hear about from another person's point of view. Uh, of course, we would always have to check them to make sure that, that somebody doesn't submit something with foul language or something like that. But other than that, you know, the more viewpoints that a person have, the more they can educate themselves on the topics themselves. And that will also encourage them to vote because they'll actually have an understanding and less fear. So what made you just get involved in politics? <laughs> uh, that was a fun one. Uh, so I went back to school after getting out, um, after being, um, what is the right term? Uh, let go is not the right term. There was like where they do the whole thing. HP gets rid of a ton of people. Can't remember the correct term. You got laid but, off. Lay off. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, forgot the word. Okay. So after I was laid off, I went back to school. And one of the classes I took for English was I didn't, it had a little mark next to it. I didn't even pay attention to, which was like, Hey, you have to do community service while you're in this. I was like, Oh, oops. <laughs> but I did, um, I figured out, well, okay, um, I can go and do community service for the Democratic Party. And so the other part or reason that I got into that was also because um, I, Bernie, um, when he came out and was around and how the crowds that he drew, uh, it also encouraged my wife, I don't know if you know her, Misty Plowright, to run for office. Uh, so then I got swept in because I, I'm not going to like take care of my wife and do stuff with her. So that was two of the things that ended up happening right around the same time that got me involved in uh, at least politics with the Democratic Party. And like there, when, when I wanted to volunteer for them for the volunteer time, um, I found out that we were doing the assemblies and I'm like, oh, you need project management for the assemblies? That's right up my alley. So I've been doing the assemblies now for three cycles. Um, and making sure that all of our candidates have the right paperwork filled out so that there's no question whether they are valid or not. And I'm very meticulous with the paperwork, go figure, um, to make sure that everything is above board and perfect. And so that's how I got involved with it. And then I just keep coming back. So um, is there something that you want to um, talk about that we haven't asked you already? Um, any points you want to highlight? Um, Hmm. You guys have been really, really thorough on it. So I think that most of the things that people worry about are being talked about. Um, I know that that Senate bill 153, there's a lot of people who are really upset with that one recently. Um, it's specifically, it's a really huge bill um, about security measures for elections. And one of the things it does though, is reduce the time that you have to keep your records. And that's not the only thing it's like 15 or more sections on it. Um, but people are really upset by the concept that we would not be keeping our records for a long period of time again because of the questions around Trump's vote. And uh, so one of the things is that it's not a mandate that I have to burn all records at that point in time. It's just say you have to keep it to this period of time and that period of time is slower. And, and as a person who keeps her tax records indefinitely, not just five or seven years, um, I don't want to get rid of records. I would rather um, keep everything and there never be a question you know, 20 years after I've run office, I've, I'm going to encourage people to keep all those records that period of time as well. And so I think that's something that a lot of people are uh, afraid of uh, with the changes of people. I, I don't want to get rid of any data. Uh, I don't do that. You know, you can, you can take data as in people who are no longer alive to vote. You can remove that from the main core, but you don't get rid of the data. You still keep all those logs. So I think that's an important thing. I'm, I, what I think is also important to me is that the integrity of the vote of the election is consistent and unquestionably accurate. And that is more important to me than who wins. I'm not rooting for one team or another. In fact, I want to be completely impartial and give everybody the same chances, but I also want to increase everybody's chances for information and knowledge as well. Uh, but more important than who wins is the integrity and the right person won because here's all the data and the numbers and the information. So I think that's the uh, other thing. Okay. Does, do you guys have any, anything? I'm good. I think we've covered everything I, I was thinking about. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we appreciate it. These will go up probably um, in the week, uh, in the next two weeks. 
on our website and then our endorsements will come out mid-June before the primary. Great. Uh, again, we appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having me. I appreciate it as well. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.